forget the face Cause I know that I do belong here Go down the checklist Let's see if feelings are good This honesty is bad And keeping inside is worse still You want a problem? Well, I guess we got one now Greetings this is my brief history of video games, part due. This is the other players in Nintendo's domination. And it's not like I'm not going to give credit to the lesser systems, what I determined the lesser systems, before the crash of 83 and everything. But they didn't dominate like Nintendo did, let's be honest. Nintendo came to just destroy the market. One of the first ones that hit was in television. Came out in 80, price tag of 299 had a pack-in game, Vegas and Poker, and there was the Blue Sky Rangers, what they were called, the five programmers. Um, Gabriel Brom, Rick Levine, Mike Meinhoff, John Saul, Dan Dagler there. I don't have a picture of Gabriel. It had uh, some better graphics and everything. It also was the first to have downloadable games but from cable TV, but when you didn't have the cable, you lost the game until they came out with something later. Also, the IntelliVoice kind of made it sound like Stephen Hawking. This is the Coleco. came out in 82. Kind of same price tag, but in my opinion, it was a little bit more technically advanced, even though technically it wasn't supposed to be, but it is in my opinion. Um, the thing about Coleco, there was a hundred some games released uh, between 82 and 85, and they struck licensing deals with Nintendo Japan, Konami, Sega, a bunch of different companies. They were infamous for saying they were going to release games and not release them. They are also supposedly doctored pictures of games in their advertising. But these are the 2600 next to the uh, ColecoVision games. The unique thing about Coleco is it was backwards compatible, so it had an add-on where you could play 2600 games. The influx of all the systems that happened when, uh, obviously, Atari got popular, is that there were so many systems that came out, like the Vectrex and Vic-20, there were too many players, so it led to a downfall. And they were kind of like the lesser hairbands, Hanoi Rocks, Dokken, to maybe a lesser extent, Zenuff. I mean, it wasn't like the other the other systems, the Motley Crews and Poisons. Here's, um, I guess, Poison or Motley Crew. This is the the, the Mark III, the SG-1000, Sega's version. And I know when the SMS or the Master System came out, uh, October of 85 released in Japan. Now, Sega Master System is supposed to be a more technically advanced piece of machinery. I never had one because, like most people in North America, I had a Nintendo. And... Um, Nintendo dominated the North American market. Sega made the, the conscious decision not to tackle it. Uh, they kind of were more popular in Europe, Australia, and, and South America and stuff. And um, I, th I think Nintendo sold about 170... No. Sega sold 175,000 to Nintendo's 2 million like in a more four-month period of consoles. That's the Famicom, if you don't know it. Uh, Nintendo's version of Nintendo in Japan. In the first version. And um, if you don't know anything about Nintendo, this is one of the great grandsons uh, of the company. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name because I can't. He's responsible for bringing it into the electronic age because Nintendo w has been around since like 1899. It was a card company, you know, card trading card, Magic the Gathering kind of crap card company. And he's one of Forbes' richest men. Like, he has like 1.8 million. And when he retired, they offered him a severance package of like 19 million. He didn't take it. And I believe he's one of the first guys to say, you know what, people buy consoles to play games. They don't buy consoles for all this peripheral bullshit that people have. I don't know if you use the term bullshit, but, you know, Blu-rays and CD players and DVDs, which is why the GameCube's made for playing games. Nintendo started off with these LCD games, if you remember. Then they segued into making the, the systems. The granddaddy, the Mac daddy, you know it, you love it, there it is, the, the NES. And the NES, um, you know... It, there's a couple things that made Nintendo really, really successful. One is their third-party license agreements, which I'll get into again. Um, again, I didn't get into it first time. And second was their programmers. I mean, they had some great programmers. Um, people that were responsible for super classic games. One of them, and I'm sure you've seen his picture demonstrating the Wii. Here he is here. Miyamoto, he's responsible for Donkey Kong, Zelda, Mario, Star Fox. So, bow down to him. If you're watching, you ever see this, which you won't, but if he ever is, he's a genius. Nintendo's third-party licensing agreement. I mean, Nintendo manufactured its own game, sure, and there's some great classic games that Nintendo made. And there are some less classic games, 
less classic. There are classics from other parties that came out, third-party companies. The thing about their third-party licensing agreement, which I think Nintendo made really slick, is one, they told the other companies, you can't make games for other consoles. Two, we're going to manufacture them, you're going to pay for them, and you have to pay for everything up front. And if your cartridges don't sell, your games don't sell, we're not buying anything back. So that was one of the reasons why uh, Nintendo put the gold stamp. It's like uh, people are going to spend a lot of time on the games, which is why there are a lot more classic games, in my opinion, for that system that they are more consistent than any other. Yeah, there are a lot of duds, but there are some that, that don't get a lot of credit that should. They're great games. And that's why today you don't get the same, even though we have better technology. There are not as good games. My friends and I used to skip school. We're like, yo, Holmes, you skipping tomorrow? Because we want to play some games. That's how many great games were. And we developed this system. And the system was like, hey, man, uh, I don't know. Give me a call in the morning and let it ring once if you are. And we would plan this stuff out. Play for hours on the phone. Skip school just to do new challenges. He'd skip school. We'd play Simon's Quest. And I'd skip school for other reasons. And we would always meet in the cafeteria with a bunch of other snapper heads and talk about games. I remember once when I, um, we would always talk about Punch-Out. You know, because it was a classic game at the time. And um, if you don't know this code by now, you should. You suck. You have to know this code. It's a given. And I remember it was like, uh, I remember once when I was saying, like, yo, dude, I was so excited. I beat Tyson by decision. I want to come to school. I'm like, yo, man, I beat Tyson. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I, I beat Tyson, man. I beat him by decision. I, I, no, you fucking didn't. And that's, I was like, oh, son of a bitch. No one believed me. I was by myself when I beat Tyson. No one saw it, so no one believed me. So uh, that kind of made me pissed off and want to play the game forever and ever. Because I didn't have any proof that I beat him, even though I knew the ending. People were like, yeah, right, whatever, man. You couldn't beat Tyson. Because people get tripped up on the Sandman and Tyson all the time. Not so much Super Macho Man. And uh, that's one of the things that made me play Tyson uh, just consistently all the time. And right now, I'm going to reveal, first time ever, take a pen, Goose's secret to beating Tyson. And yes, it has to do with watching the clock. And yes, you, you can watch his feet movements, of course, but the, the real key to being consistently great with Tyson is blink when you're punching him, and don't blink when you're not. Because the moment you blink is when he's going to flash, and you'll miss it. And that way you don't have to memorize anything, you just blink when you're punching him. One of the other things is you have to play with the regular joystick, because you can get the speed. And if you dodge quick enough, you can, um, you know, look... I'm kind of rusty, as you see. I'm just dodging for nothing sometimes. Um, and that's one of the things that you could do. You could consistently beat Tyson if you dodge at the right times and everything. See, look. Just right there. Dodging for nothing. What's wrong with me? And one of the things that always pissed me off about Tyson is that no matter how much you beat his ass, his face never got bruised or anything. You could have a flawless victory in nothing. So we would skip school to play a game all the time. I mean, you know, screw school. I want to play some games. And I remember we were playing Turtles 3 once. And we skipped school, we stayed home, and my girlfriend at the time... What? My girlfriend looked like that. I mean, if Jimmy Kimmel could nail something like that, why can't I? The goose could. Alright, fine. My girlfriend at the time, she decided... Alright, my girlfriend at the time. She uh, knows we... Alright, who am I shitting? My girlfriend at the time knows uh, what we weren't in school, and she came and just drove to my house and broke up the party, man. What is it about having a vagina that makes you, like, not responsive to playing video games? Like, you... Some girls say they're playing games and they're cool, but they, they lie to you. Come on. I included these Lego things because I thought they were cool, and it also illustrates the fact how burned in the consciousness you can recognize these games, and they're made out of Lego. And I can't prove this fact, but I think NES was the first time where men started ignoring women playing video games. And that really took off with, with PlayStation and everything else and Xbox. Ooh. But the thing about Nintendo is... There weren't walkthroughs, there wasn't the internet. If you didn't figure it out, you wandered around or you were screwed. And yeah, there was the player's guide, and you know, Nintendo had Nintendo Power, and later on there was EGM and Game Pro and all that crap, but you had to figure it out. My friends and I developed our own lingo. Or you know, I came up with Zelda Day. What I would call Zelda Day would be a day in October when it's like fifty degrees out. One of the snapper heads we ate lunch with, he always used to call the dungeons or labyrinths the Brints. In every game it was a Brint, even non Zelda games. If you had three guys, you're down to one. You had to commit if a game was ultimate. Meaning the game had ultimate continues. You could commit to the continuation point and, and beat the boss. Toast, I used that way before Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat 2 used it. 6-2 
obviously after it came out, that's how you judge how hard a game was. It's hey man, that's harder in six two. A lot of bosses had unhittable spots in, in 8-bit games where you could just tag the boss and nothing. And some games were duds. If you bought them, they were dud. They aren't fun to play. Some games like Metroid were uh, had their own lingo like wall walking. And the thing we discovered about Metroid is that if you uh, used the NES Advantage, you could use the slow-mo option and the turbo and create passwords. You just hold, hold down turbo and the slow-mo and just move the joystick around eventually odd passwords would come where there would be parts of the game that are new parts of the game that didn't exist weird weapons that, that you can't find anywhere I don't know it's just cool you should try it sometime if you didn't have any other recourse you could call the Nintendo Power Hotline and I remember once I was playing Deadly Towers we were and we found this amulet or whatever it was agape something we didn't, we didn't know what the hell it was we couldn't see what it did so we called him we're like dude I, I found this Mr. Counselor what the hell is it and he's like what I don't know what that is let me call you back and he took my number and he called me back which I thought was cool and they're all kind of peripherals that came out from the Nintendo I mean it, it was so popular a bunch of other things some were good some of them weren't let's give props quote unquote props to Nintendo's handheld market they dominated it they've always dominated it even today from the Game Boy to the Game Boy Pocket to the Advance to all of it. And other companies have tried, but they didn't even touch them. I'm not going to say that Nintendo didn't explode where and, and so many game, so many other games are recognizable other than Mario. You remember Captain N? Now that was pretty cool. Although they metrosexualized Simon Belmont, made Mega Man a putz, Icarus, the Icarus. And why did Mother Brain sound like a ghetto rat? Explain that to me. You know she did. Excuse me, princess! I always hated his sword. It was too tiny. California. And that pretty much marked the end. I mean, Christian Slater and Fred Savage pretty much marked the end. Uh, that's when Nintendo was in the works with the Super Nintendo. And they were, they were uh, I think at the time, talking with Sony because Sony was going to do the CD. But Sony wanted to own some crap. And Nintendo was like, screw you. And Sony was like, screw you, asshole. We'll make our own system. And uh, I don't think they saw that one coming. But I'll see you guys in part three and four when it comes out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You know, tell me about your experiences. What, what the crap? Tell me how, uh, what you went through when you were playing games. And I'll see you later.